Beretta first appeared in 1526 when they sold 185 arquebus barrels to the city of Venice, the arsenal of Venice. Ever since, they have been making gun parts and guns, and today we're going to have a little look at some of their history and a little bit about them. So post 1526, for about 350 years, they continued to make barrels and components. And in the mid 1800s, Giuseppe Beretta decided to start making complete guns. Giuseppe's dad, Pietro, actually founded the whole company as Fabrica d'Armi Pietro Beretta. And by 1860, they were making 300 guns a year. Giuseppe's son, also named Pietro, took over the company in the early 1900s and he really pushed it forward, making it much of the international brand we know and love today. Throughout the early 20th century, they really went from strength to strength. To be fair, they weren't keeping up with fashions. I mean, they offered hammer guns up until the 70s and they even offered pinfires as late as 1938, one source told me. I mean, and pinfires went out of fashion 50 years before that plus. However, keeping their eyes on tradition didn't mean they didn't keep their eyes on the future as well. The company was growing. They were producing thousands of firearms in the early 20th century. They had their own power plant and more importantly, they were looking at the big competition. In this instance, the big competition was Browning. Browning have just released the Superpose, the Superpose being the first proper over and under commercially available. So to combat the Superpose that Browning had put out there, Pietro Beretta turned to his friend, Tullio Marangoni, who was one of the greatest firearms designers of all time, to be honest. And they sat down and they had a little look at the Browning. They decided that the action was deep, the action was ugly, and there was something they could do that was just significantly better. And out of all of this conversation came the SO. The Browning was held together with two lumps that held the back and forth movement and one bite that held the up and down movement around the axis. These are the two forces you obviously have to pay attention to when locking up a gun. Looking at a side by side, for example, you have lumps to stop it going forward and back and a bite to stop it going up and down around the axis. These guys did not like the depth that it came with an over and under, so they looked at it a different way. Although this is a 686 action, a lot of that design from the SO came into this in one way or another. What they looked at, instead of having a joint bar, they actually put in two trunnions. Instead of having a locking thing underneath, they put a crossbar onto two lumps at the back of the action. And instead of having lumps that drop through the bottom to stop that back and forth motion, they put cutouts in the side of the action so they could actually mate the barrels and the action together that way. It was cutting edge by comparison to the Browning, however, was set at a very different price point. I mean, the design concept for the SO proved so good that they now use it in the DT-11 and they used it in the ASE, the DT-10, and a multitude of their other models over the years because it was such a quality action. The only place it has changed is in the SO-10, but we'll move into that later. There's another very important thing that Beretta actually pioneered, and that was these, the monoblock barrels, which is pretty much what everybody uses now. Instead of getting two tubes and fusing them together, they decided actually what we're gonna do is we're gonna make the locking head, we're gonna make the block, and then we're gonna make two tubes, and we're gonna just chuck them inside, weld them on, put some ribs on, and that's actually gonna save us a lot of time. You've gotta remember they had 400 years as barrel makers for experience, so they really were at the cutting edge of barrel love. So the original SO, retrospectively called the SO1, seeing as they released the SO2, the SO3, the SO4, etc., actually was really quite good. It was quite popular. It was initially intended as a hunting clay crossover. However, that was really very shortly joined by a more dedicated clay gun and a more dedicated game gun. These being the SO2 and suddenly the SO3 and so on and so forth. And they really divide themselves into hardcore clay guns and really beautiful hunting guns. Most people will know the SO from the SO4. This was released in 1968 and produced through the early 70s. It's the one that you can see that is mo probably most affordable, probably one of the plainest out there as well and generally speaking, the one that most people own. The SO5 was released in 1989 and is still pretty much made up until this day. It's a good looking gun and uh, is an absolute fortune. Anyway, now we've looked at the SOs for a bit, let's move back and look at the guns that we all own. Actually, before we do that, it's worth saying that they do do small gauge SOs, although the original runs were all in 12 bore. The SO9 that was released in the 90s came in 28, 20, and subsequently 410. So you can have a very expensive small gun that is really beautiful. It still remains the SO as the flagship model of Beretta shotguns. They are beautiful, they are completely handmade, and they are not all one offs, but of course they are with a hand engraved. They're all semi-unique. Uh, there is a downside to SOs and that's that the stock work around the head is all very thin so it's probably the only Beretta stock that is likely to break. I say likely. Has a slightly higher degree of chance to break uh, than an S57, S56, 86, 86, 680 or 690 uh, which are 
very meaty, very strong, and uh, feature a big old stock bolt. So the SO, the Sovereign Posto, was obviously their top-end flagship model, but they did release guns for us more common folk as well. Uh, one of the first and most commercially viable one of those was the S56. E. The S56E was released in the 70s and was really a game gun. It was joined by the S57 later on and the S58, which was more of their, again, trapline gun. But it was the first time we saw an action that was anything like this. We, not being me because I wasn't alive. But they were brilliant. They were nothing like the force they were to be reckoned with today. Mostly because, well, who wanted to buy a Beretta? At the time, people were still very much cyber side centric and if it wasn't over and under, it was more than likely a Browning. However, this was really the start of Beretta's popularity. They became known as really reliable guns that didn't cost a great deal of money. The S56, as I've said, was really the test bed for what later became the 680. The later ones had coil springs. They started life with a V-spring, um, suddenly realized that actually if you made a coil spring, it would be cheaper to produce and probably last a little longer and be cheaper to replace. They had a lot of the act stuff out of the SO that went into it, so it was a much lower profile gun. Very, very light and very, very pointable. The S56E was also chromed in the bores in the later editions, so it became a gun that you could not even have to clean. I mean, and this was really starting the modern era of solidarity in guns and what people expect today out of a shotgun was really put in place by Beretta. So there was a huge variety of the S56, S57, S58. They did double trigger models, non-ejector models, but generally speaking, they are good, solid guns. I mean, one in bad condition will cost you two to 250, and one in mint condition can go up to about 750. Uh, if you have enough inkling to do that, when for 750, you might be able to buy one of these, which is a little bit more modern. Both the S56 and the S57 were available in EL and EEL formats, which is something they continue to today. The EL stands for Extra Luso, and the EEL stands for Extra Extra Luso Luso, or Extra Lovely and Extra Extra Lovely Lovely. Um, essentially, they were their designations for higher grades, better engraving, and, you know, prettier guns with the same action. Both models were available in 26, 28, and 30. However, finding a 30 model was really rare because they just weren't popular at the time. All right, so that's pretty much early 1950 Beretta all the way up until the late 70s Beretta, when this sort of thing first appeared. Uh, obviously, it didn't look at all like this, uh, but it kind of did. It was called the S680. The S680 was a plain, unengraved, stamped borders with a couple of little scroll bits cut by hand clay gun. They obviously did game models as well, but the clay gun was the one to have. Really well made, well finished internals, and was probably one of the last hand finished entry level Berettas. They built up their reliability reputation with the S56 and S57 before it, and obviously their quality reputation with the Sovereign Prosto, the SO series. And as such, they did start to gain momentum, and through the 90s, Beretta really started to become what it is today a gigantic, gun making, marketing giant, making quality guns for affordable money. Shortly after the S680, you had the S686 and the S682, or the 682 Gold thereafter. The 682 Gold, or the 682 being the clay and sporting models, and the 686 being the game model. They were rolled engraving on the 686, they were less exciting, but you know what they cost in the middle 90s? Like 420 quid. They were very, very reasonably priced, and they were a great gun. Moving on, the 682 was replaced by the 682 Gold E. The 682 Gold E had mach complete machine engraving by comparison to the 682 Gold, which still had that plain action with a little bit cut by hand. And they really started to move into a more modern world of using technology to build guns, which is great. I mean, I like that a lot. The 682 Gold E and the 686, which became the Silver Pigeon in 1996, 1995, I believe. Uh, and I've been told by multiple sources that's because they went to the American market and the Americans respond better to names and the 686 was already taken by a pistol. Thus the Silver Pigeon name was born. However, most people still refer to it as a 686. That all continued nice and well up until about 2011, 2012, when the Silver Pigeon was replaced by the S686 Silver Pigeon 1. A modernized version, different engraving, slightly different wood, and generally it was an excuse for them to drop the price and drop the quality and then increase the crop price back with the same with lesser quality to the same price. That's just the way capitalism works, guys, so don't get angry at Beretta for, you know, doing a very good job. Shortly after the 682 was actually replaced by the 690 series. The 690 series, as we have discussed in the past, is a little wider, a little deeper, a bit bigger in the hand, and was maybe looking to take a little bit of the browning market away. Have something a bit deeper and a bit more manoeuvrable for the really serious target shooters. Fast forward to now, they still make the Silver Pigeon in the base grades. Uh, however, back nine, 10 years ago, they were making a Silver Pigeon 1, they did a 2, they did a 3, they did a 4, and they did a 5, then they did an EL and a double E double L. They really have thinned out their offering of the 686 series and are expanding the offering of the 690 series. 
confusing? Yeah, quite probably, but you know, that's pretty much, we like being baffled, don't we? It's good for good for sales. Nowadays, Beretta as a company is a huge multinational. Pietro in the early 1900s really grew it and has been continued to be groomed by his children and their children's children. They now own Franchi, Seiko, Tika, Stoga, uh, Burris, Steiner, lots of things. They own a vast amount of companies. Uh, and as such, rumors float around that these things are now made in Turkey or whatever you want, and there's always people ready to badmouth them, but they do pretty much make everything still entirely in Italy, and if they don't, they're usually quite public about it. For example, they made the ES100 semi-automatic, uh, and that was clearly not made by them, uh, although had their barrel on, but all the furniture and assembly was done in Spain. Obviously, their sporting shotguns only make up a very small portion of the market they deal with. They obviously make pistols, the Breton I2FS, they make rifles, plenty of gear for the army, and where they own a plenty of other companies as well, obviously, their attention is divided across the board. So what does the future hold for Beretta? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, we've seen a bit of a decrease in sales over the last few years, and that's because the market has shifted away from Beretta, which was once extremely affordable. I mean, if you look back seven years, this gun, which now retails at 1550, was £1,025. So they have increased in price. A lot of that's to do with the euro, with modern manufacturing costs, and, you know, we obviously have to accept that, but at the same time, the market has responded accordingly. We're now looking for the new Beretta. We're looking for that new five or six hundred pound gun or that cheaper gun, sub thousand pound gun, let's say, that can be just as reliable and just as good. I genuinely feel like these still represent great value for money. I mean, you could buy a 686 Silver Pigeon 1 and own it for the rest of your life. Your children own it for the rest of their life. And what they've done is produce a gun that, with all the wearing parts that are interchangeable. That is extremely intelligent. And they're not hard to interchange either. So I guess that's why they're as popular as they are. I guess that is the real refined and redeeming feature of the 680 action, all the S56 action, is just that it was slimline, it was really well built, and if you did manage to wear it out, it could replace all the bits for very little money. I know I really haven't touched on semi-automatics today, but I'm feeling that that's going to be a separate video, Beretta semi-automatics, a history. But before I finish, what I'd really like to go into is... Were older Berettas better than modern Berettas? It's something that we hear all the time is, oh, they're not as good as the old ones. Oh, they were amazing in the 90s and so on and so forth. The first things first, you'll probably hear this from people who were using that gun in the 90s. And I guess everything was better when you had it first and looking back in time, everything is looked at through rose tinted glasses. But is it true? Well, it's yes and no. Okay, it depends what you value. I love a Beretta 680. I think they're beautiful guns. I have owned a 680 Skeet in the past. The woodwork has a better finish than the modern ones. The metalwork has a slightly better finish than the modern ones. The internals have a slight hand finish. They are more hand regulated because mostly the machining wasn't as accurate as it is today, so they needed to do that. And that brings us on to, do they need to do it anymore? Of course not. Uh, we didn't have computers, we didn't have phones, we didn't have anything in the 90s by comparison to what we have today, which we did, but they weren't anything what we have today. Now, CNC CAD design is amazing. I mean, they can cut stuff within hundreds of a thou. So why the hell would you get something that is made absolutely perfectly, cut to a perfect polish, and then go, I'll tell you what, let's get someone to finish this just to say that we have. I don't know. Yes, there is an element that they are less hand finished than they ever were, and that maybe gives you more of a, a soulless character in a modern Brett than an old one. Uh, but I think that's probably just being overly romantic because they still shoot just as well, sort of. Um, and they're still brilliant guns. So they're not made any less well, but maybe they're made less romantically. And I suppose in reality, uh, we buy guns because we are all hopeless romantics, or at least anybody who buys guns like I do does. Guys, thank you very much for watching. Take care, goodbye, and I'll see you possibly in part two for a Bretta Semi-Automatics A Brief History. Take care. Guys, welcome to the gun shop.